And we want to, we also want to just let everybody know that uh, we're having some amazing breakthroughs on our Monday and Friday nights. We're, we're actually responding to a, a word that came through Pastor Gentile. How many of you remember Pastor Gentile when he came? And he, uh, he, he, he had a powerful word over this church. And he said that God's plan for this church was greater than we even realized. And he said that he was expecting a response from us seeking his face. And as, as we would seek his face, God would respond in such a way that would even be beyond what we could even imagine or think. And in fact, it said the Lord was going to whistle. God was going to whistle and he was going to draw those in that were to be planted in this house, but that also God wanted to do something very, very supernatural, something brand new. How many of you know God's doing a new thing? Amen? Amen. And I, I want to just, I pray this morning that as you come into the house of the Lord this morning, I pray that you would begin to realize that Everything that happens today is not just uh, by accident. We believe that God is here to bring a word of impartation. We believe that our gathering together is about transformation. Amen? Uh, you're not just here coming to church just to hear some songs and, and go through a, a message. God is here to bring and take you much higher than where you've ever been. Amen? Amen? I want to open up with a scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. If we could turn to Ephesians 3, verse 20, uh, then we're going to jump over to Mark 6. I want to share a few things this morning, and I want to talk to you about moving from our world into his world. Can you say amen? amen. How many of you believe God wants to bring his world into our world? And he wants we, our world, to move into his world. I want you to read this, read this with me. It says, now to him who was able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Everyone say, ask or think. Amen. How many, how many of you know God wants to do something that is much greater than what we think? God's, God is a God of great thoughts. He's a God with a great plan. God doesn't think small. He doesn't think with any limitations. In fact, his very coming was to not only bring salvation to man, his, his plan is much bigger than getting you to heaven. God's plan is bringing heaven to earth. God's plan is expansion. It's about increase. It's about enlarging you. It's about bringing you from a place where you're just an ordinary existing individual where you are so transformed and so full of life and so full of power, so full of God, that the very life of God, the very power, His presence begins to flow out your innermost being. Amen? And all of you, and, and so one of the most important things this morning as the Lord is doing to us is He's transforming our minds. Amen? Everyone say your mind. Your mind is the battlefield. And so many of us have been raised in different denominations. Many, we've come out of different churches. We've come out of different families. We've come out of different situations. And sometimes we've never heard of a gospel that is a gospel of empowerment or a gospel of life. Jesus didn't raise from the dead so that we would just have the promise of a future resurrection. Jesus raised from the dead from that point on so that you and I would be transformed and filled with resurrection power now. Everyone say now. now. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, he went to Martha. And he says, do you believe that Lazarus can be raised from the dead? Her response was, yeah, well, Lord, I know that in the resurrection of the dead, he will come back to life. No. And Jesus said, no. He said, I am now the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me now, yet shall he live. Everyone say live. Amen. See, God's interested in you living life. And not only is he interested in you living life, he's interested in you being a conduit of heaven on earth. Jesus' prayer was, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now I want you to look at your neighbor and say, I see heaven all over you. <laughs> Praise God. I see heaven. I see life on you. Amen. You may say, well, Pastor Ray, I don't see heaven on them. My George, I, I don't know what I see on them, but I don't see heaven. I mean, I just woke up with them this morning, and we had to brush our teeth, put on our clothes, and take a shower. That's not a whole lot of heaven right there. Well, I want you to know, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. Amen? The Bible says, they that have the faith of Abraham, they are the sons of God. What was the faith of Abraham? God came to Abraham when he was old, when his wife was barren. They were beyond the years of childbearing, and God said to Abraham, Abraham, I'm calling you out. Everyone say out. out. See, one of the things in order for you to come in to anything, you've got to move out of where you were. You see, you're never going to come into revelation, you're never going to come in to increase, or come into the blessing of God until you begin to move out of where you were. Some of us have kind of gotten comfortable with being at a place of unbelief, where we're narrow-minded, small-minded, thinking small, thinking little, thinking weak. We look at ourselves and we see how frail and how empty and how weak we are, and God gave us the power of the Holy Spirit so that the grace of God, the power of God, would not come from you, but from Him who dwells in you. That's why Paul says it's Christ in you. Everyone say, in me. The hope of glory. You see, the hope of glory is Christ in me. And so God's not interested in just you thinking of a future tense glory or a future tense heaven when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. God's not interested. I want to tell you that him is not even godly. Not even of God. God wants to bring heaven now on earth. He said, you are the salt. You are the light of the earth. And have, have you been walking like that? Have you been talking like that? Have you been looking? You may say, well, Pastor Ray, I've been confessing and believing God, and I've been standing on his promises, and it seems like, my George, it just seems like everything seems to be going south. I'll never forget, a couple of years ago, I had a young man come up to me. He said, Pastor Ray, I just feel the call of God in my life. I just feel God wants to bring me into a greater understanding, greater revelation. I believe God wants to do some great things in my life. And I just want you to pray right now and anoint me and let's agree together. And I said, amen, I'm all for that. So I prayed with this guy and I anointed him with oil. And I said, Father, just bring a revelation, open his eyes. Lord, just begin to uh, work in his life as you begin to move on his heart concerning this high calling in his life. And we prayed, he went away, and three, four, five, six months went by, and all of a sudden he comes back. He says, Pastor Ray, I just need you to pray for me right now. I said, what's going on? He says, all hell's breaking loose. I don't understand it. Things are falling apart. It just doesn't make sense. And I said, wait a minute, time out. Do you remember what we prayed for three, four, five months ago? No, I don't. He forgot what we prayed for. He said, do you remember when you came to me and you said that you felt God was stirring your heart and that God wanted you to come up higher and God wanted to use you in a more effective way and that the Lord would put some dreams and visions in your mind. And you thought, do you remember that? Yeah, I do. I said, guess what? God's answering your prayer. He said, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. I, I didn't think that that was the answer to prayer. I said, D do, you know, do you know what Christian Christianity is all about? Christianity is about you becoming a solution to a problem. Do you know why Jesus was so great, so powerful, why the message of the gospel is so mad? Because it answers a problem. Jesus came and he solved a problem. The purpose of Christian, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is to make you the solution to someone else's problem. God never came here just so that you could just kind of throw a flowery message of hope about someday in the sweet old by and by when we meet on that beautiful show. No, God intended for you to be a solution to a problem. Everyone say solution. solution. 
<clears throat> you are not a problem because of a problem. You're the solution to the problem. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a solution. Now turn to them and say, you've got the solution. You've got the solution. I, I mean, the gospel is as simple as this. Whether you're dealing with sin problems, whether you're dealing with setbacks, how many of you know that every setback is intended to be a set up for a promotion? God never intended for your setbacks to weigh you down, to keep you down. God intended for a setback is to be a set up for a promotion. When nothing's going on, that means God's up to something. We need to start thinking for the nothings because God's up to somethings. And you see, one of the things what we're doing is we're viewing, we're thinking wrong. We're thinking below what he intended. That's why the most important thing for every believer is to begin to renew and to begin to harvest and to begin to cultivate the Word of God in your mind because it's the hearing of the Word that begins to impart the power of the Word that brings a creative Word that begins to bring a living Word into people's life. In other words, you're, you're now becoming a problem solver. You're not just simply going through life and giving people hope. God intended for you to solve problems. And by the way, we're not talking about solving problems in church. No, what, what we're here doing here at New Life Fellowship, this is kind of like the Dallas Cowboys meeting in the locker room. This is called pep talk. Amen. How many of you know the games are not played and won in the locker room? They're played on the field. Amen. Amen. How many of you believe God wants you to make some touchdowns? Yeah. God wants you to gain some yardage. Amen. You might deep, be deep into the enemy's territory, into the red zone. God wants you to go all the way beyond the red zone. He wants you to make some touchdowns. He wants you to know that greater is he that's in the world. He wants you to understand that you, you actually possess the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God. You possess the life of God. You possess the kind of breakthrough. And let, let me tell you where that comes from. Sometimes we say, okay, God, I've been waiting for the breakthrough. I'm waiting for you to give me the answers. I'm waiting for you, God, to just show up and do something, God. No, God's waiting for you to act. Listen to me. He's waiting for you to act when you don't know what to do. Let me tell you something. Some of us think, well, I won't move until God makes it so plain and clear. No, it'll never work that way. He wants you to act and move when you don't understand. The Bible says by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. See, faith is not about knowing. Faith is about going but not knowing. Faith is about embracing. Now, I want to take you back into Mark chapter 6 this morning because this is, a, this is something we went over a couple of weeks ago. This is when Jesus is in the desert in the wilderness and for the sake of time, I'm just going to give you the story. Jesus is in the wilderness. He's been feeding, ministering, and teaching. And there are 5,000 men. And the Bible says it was coming near the end of the day, late in the day. And the disciples said, Lord, we need to send these people away because they're hungry. There's no food out here. We are in the wrong place. It's the wrong time. And we need to send them away. That was their solution to the problem. Basically, the disciples were saying, we can't do about nothing about this. Jesus says, do not send them away, you feed them. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have the answer. Now the disciples, the Bible says they start looking at each other, and they're confused. By the way, if you are ever in a place of confusion, you are in a good place. You may say, well, why, why, why is that a good place? Because you see, God loves it when you're weak, because that's when his grace is made perfect. In fact, God doesn't like it when you think you know it all. God's not actually happy when you are so smart and so strong in your own strength. Because guess what? He can't do anything supernatural. When people who think they got it all together. God loves, God is attracted to weakness. He's attracted to people that can't do it. That can't do anything. The Bible says when we are weak, he is strong. There's something about you being in a very vulnerable, weak place 
that is attracted, that attracts him to you. Because no flesh will glory in his presence. He wants you to get used to being in very vulnerable places. Now, I know some of us this morning said, boy, I didn't come to hear a message like this. I didn't come here to have somebody tell, tell me that when I'm weak and vulnerable and when things are not going well, uh, that that's when God's going to begin to speak to me. I'm going to tell you, heaven is shouting at you. Heaven, right now, the Holy Spirit's been knocking on some of your doors. He's been speaking to some of you. You've been going through some difficult times, and I'm here to tell you, God is saying, I'm standing right here. I'm waiting on you to act. I'm waiting on you to speak. I'm waiting on you to move forward. Can you say amen? amen? The Bible says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. In the wilderness, they're in this place. No, no food. All these people, Jesus was in the height of his popularity. Jesus tells his disciples, you feed them. You have the solution to this problem. Amen. Now turn to your neighbor again and tell him, you've got the solution. Amen. You have the solution. What Jesus was doing is he's teaching them how to bring his world into our world. Now, one of the things that we are, by, by nature, we are not comfortable in a particular zone. We are not comfortable when our comfort zone has been disturbed. We're not comfortable when we have to trust God, when we cannot put faith in our five senses or our circumstances, when things are shaken around us. Sometimes I've even, I've even heard Christians say this, I must be doing something wrong because things are happening. I'm saying, no, you haven't done anything wrong. In fact, God loves you even more. God's preparing you for something great. Oh, that can't be. God's been stirring my neck. No, it's not about a setback. It's not about a failure. It's not about weakness. It's not about... Now, I, I do agree. I do believe that there are times where we can create a mess. We can sow some real bad seed and make some bad choices in life, and we can reap some bad fruit. I know that. But I'm not talking about people who just go out and make stupid decisions, and I do not believe I'm speaking to people like that. I believe I'm speaking to people here that love God. I believe I'm speaking to champions. I believe I'm speaking to people right here that really want to come up higher and see God's power and the increase of his kingdom in their life. I believe I'm talking to people right now that are some amazing prayer warriors. I believe I'm talking to some Esther's and some David's here and some Samson's and Daniel's that are going to see the heavens open on their life. I believe that and I prophetically speak it over you. Because I know right now greater is he that's within us. But when Jesus was in that wilderness... Jesus said, what do you have? And the Bible says that they found a little boy with five loaves, barley loaves, and two fish. And Jesus said, bring it to me. And remember what the disciples said? They said, what are these against so many that we have to feed? What is this? How many here have ever found yourself beginning to almost criticize in your life, the thing that God wants to do. You can criticize where you're at. You can criticize your marriage. You can criticize your job. You can criticize the little wage that you're making and yet not even realize that God is actually setting you up for something powerful. There is nothing that is coming against you right now that God does not know about, that he has not given you the grace to go through it come out on the other side, raise you up, and use your life as a testimony to become a solution for other people. God never intended for you to live a wasted life. You are not wasting your time. You are not wasting life. God intends for you to take every setback and every problem and to begin to draw the nutrients and draw the wisdom and draw the very life, but he wants you to look at it differently. He wants to transform the lens of how you see things. Amen? So what Jesus does, 
He takes the loaves. The Bible says, we all know it. He begins to break the loaves. First of all, the Bible says he looks up to heaven, and I'm, I'm so grateful for that. Jesus doesn't sit there and look at the size of the loaves. He looks up to heaven. How many of you know that we need to keep our eyes on our Heavenly Father? You see, sometimes God, some of us, we look at what we have, and we start thinking about what we have and where we're at, and we start getting where, wow, this is not much. Oh, my short God, I'm not going to make it with this. The Bible says that Jesus looked up and gave thanks. And then he said he blessed it. Everyone say bless. How many of you are willing to bless where you're at? You've got to learn to be thank blessing, speak blessing, even though you may feel you're like you're walking through a curse. I'm going to bless these five little loaves and these two little fish. I know i got a bigger problem out here, but this is all i got. I'm going to bless it. I'm going to think. I'm going to come into alignment with supernatural thinking. You see, God has to find someone on earth that agrees with what is already in heaven. Everyone say agreement. Agreement is the most powerful position of faith you have. Everyone say agreement again. Agreement. He's looking for someone that will agree on earth as it is in heaven. What's in heaven? What's in heaven? Life. What's in heaven? Miracles. What's in heaven? There's no sickness. What's in heaven? There's always a rich supply of life. There's a rich supply. But what he's looking for is people on earth to agree that I have a rich supply. In the face of my lack. In the face of my need. In the face. I am going to stand on the promises of God, for the promises of God are yes and amen. It's not no, it's not maybe, it's not might, it is yes and amen. You see, one of the things that Carol and I, we've had to do and we're still doing, even in the face of things that we cannot, we don't necessarily see change on, we give thanks, now we didn't always do this, but we're giving thanks to God for things that we don't necessarily see changing yet. And you know what? i got to tell you, there's sometimes it seems so ridiculous. It seems so ridiculous to give thanks for things that just don't seem right. But you know what? I've come to realize that the best way to disempower, to, dis, to dethrone the powers of darkness is when you begin to love and you begin to worship God in the face of of a demonic assault in your life. When you begin to lift your hands and you begin to worship God, that's what Jesus is doing there in Mark chapter 6. Then the Bible says this. Then he gave the loaves and the fish to the disciples and they begin to disperse. And they were fed and all the 5,000 men, some scholars believe 15, 20,000 people might have been there, including women and children. And the Bible says they took up 12 baskets full. Aren't you thankful for the little boy who brought the lunch that day? Guess what? He went home with 12 baskets full and he fed his mom. I bet you his mom said, what'd you do with the five loaves and two fishes? I gave it to Jesus and the whole clan of disciples. Why'd you do that for? Well, they said they needed to feed it. Well, guess what, Mom? We got 12 baskets full. Because I believe those 12 baskets went home with that boy. Because I believe Jesus uh, was fulfilling the promise that when you give, it will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over. And so he goes home. But the interesting thing happens right after this. In Matthew chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. In Matthew 6, notice what happens. Verse 45. Mark chapter 6, verse 45, it says, Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him. Everyone say before him. This is a very important verse here. Now keep in mind they just fed the 5,000. He just said, I want you to go before me. He is now commissioning them. I'm commissioning you to go before me. Now this was not an out of ordinary request. Jesus has done this before. But he's, and, and by the way, they're mariners. They, they know that they're fishermen. They know how to row boats. They know how to sail boats. They've been out on the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus says, I want you guys 
to go before me. We've just experienced this amazing miracle here, the feeding of the 5,000. They experienced the miracle, but the problem is the disciples didn't learn the lesson. Do you know that it's possible to obey God, to be thankful and to worship and to give God thanks because he does a great miracle, but actually miss the lesson on what the miracle was all about? It's possible. Let me tell you what's happened for years in America. For years in America, we've gone to Catherine Coleman meetings and uh, Benny Hinn meetings and other evangelists and ministries. And we love to go to those meetings and we like to celebrate what God did through the big man of God on the platform. Wow. And, and we kind of think that it's more of a show and tell exhibition. I want to tell you right now that that's not what God has in mind for us to celebrate one man or one woman who has lots of faith to do great miracles. God intended for the entire church to become movers and shakers. For the entire body of Christ, for miracles, walking in wisdom, walking on water, raising the dead, clean, cleansing the leper, healing the sick. He intended for the power of heaven to be something that would be a very, very normal activity in our life. He intends for that which is in heaven his world to become our world. He intends that our world, amen, be open to what is in his world. And so what he does, he sends the disciples ahead, and you know the story. And when he had sent them away, verse 46, he departed to the mountain to pray. Verse 47, when evening had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea. Everyone say in the middle. Sometimes God sends us something, we get into the middle, and we get into problems. And he was alone on the land, and he saw them straining at rowing. Notice this. While Jesus is on land, it says he sees them straining. How many of you know God can see you straining? He can see you sweating it. Have everybody ever sweat out there? I have. There's been times where I've been sweating, and you say, man, God, I'm doing what you said. Where are you? And he sees me straining. And it says, and the winds were contrary or against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, and he would have passed by them. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and they cried out. Man, these guys are freaking out now. They see this guy walking on the water. And how many of you know that being a disciple back in Jesus' day would have kind of been kind of interesting. See all these things going on. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they cried, they supposed to saw the ghost, for they all saw him, and they were troubled. And immediately he talked with them. Let me tell you something. When you get in trouble, when you're getting stressed and strained out, get ready to watch and experience Jesus walking on your water. I, I want you to understand God's getting ready to set you up for amazing things. They saw him, they were troubled. Immediately they, he talked with them, said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not, notice verse 52, key verse, for they had not understood about the loaves. Because their hearts were hard. Now listen to this. They did not understand. What in the world does a storm at sea have to do with anything about the loaves and the fishes? Well, jump over with me to chapter 8. Aren't you glad God doesn't give, give up on us when we don't get it the first time? Amen. Say amen. Amen. Because now we come to the feeding of the 4,000. He feeds the 5,000. Two chapters over, he starts feeding the 4,000. In other words, God wants us to begin to get the lesson. Here in those days, chapter 8, verse 1, the multitude being very great, having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples, Kevin, having compassion on the multitude, because they now continue with me three days, nothing to eat. Verse 3, if I send them away hungry to their own houses, they will faint on the way. For some of them have come from afar. Aren't you grateful God's concerned about you not fainting? He says, I'm not going to send them away hungry. 
I'm not going to send them away because I, I know they've been with me and I'm concerned about them fainting. Now, we've got a wonderful Savior. We've got a wonderful Master. He says, I'm not going to send you away. I'm not going to send you away hungry. I'm not going to send you away without your needs. I am committed to meeting your needs. I want to say somebody needs to hear that this morning, that Jesus sees you straining, stressing. He sees you under a lot of stuff going on. He sees you almost fainting. He says, I'm not going to send you away. Jesus, right now, I pray, Lord, you just touch the heart of the hearts of those who have been in the middle of a storm. Father, I pray right now that you would touch them and lift their vision. Let them know, Lord, that they do have faith. I come against the enemy who would bring con condemnation that would say they've sinned, they've fallen, they've slipped back into backsliding. I come against the voice of the enemy. Lord, you still love us even when we're faint even when we're hungry, even when we don't get it the first time or the second time, you are consistent, you are faithful. We speak life to your people this morning in Jesus' name. And so it says here in chapter 8, the disciples said, how, verse 4, how can we satisfy these people with bread here in the wilderness? I want you to see something. I want you to notice how the disciples are thinking concerning a problem. They look at the problem, they see the size of the problem, but isn't it interesting, the one thing they don't get, Jesus is with them. Jesus, how many of you know that when Jesus is with you, there's nothing to be afraid of? Now, Jesus was with them in feeding of the 5,000, but Jesus intentionally withheld himself from getting into the boat because he wanted them to know that when I commission you to do something, and even though it looks like my presence is not with you, I'm still with you. Even though it doesn't feel like or look like I'm not with you, I'm still with you. Because that's why he said, oh, you of little faith. Now notice what happens. They feed the 4,000. He commands them to sit down and they, they minister. And, <clears throat> and uh, they feed the 4,000 and he immediately got into the boat with his disciples and they came to the region of Dalamutha. Verse, jump down to chapter 8, verse 13. And he left them getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread. Here's this whole story about bread and these storms. And they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. Then he charged them, take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now what was it? He answers it in the next verse. For they reasoned among themselves, saying, is it because we don't have bread? But Jesus, being aware of it, said, why do you reason? Everyone say reason. Jesus here is hitting at the heart of the problem. You guys are not seeing my power because you are trying to reason. And you're trying to work things out in your own logic. You're trying to reason things out. How many of you know God wants us to stop reasoning things through our own mind? Now, I know that some of you are saying, well, Pastor Ray, I think reason, we need to have some reason, we need to have some logic, we need to have some brains. We need to, are you saying that we should just kind of throw reason out the, to the wind and just not be reasonable at all? No, because what, when it comes to faith, we act in faith because we've been commissioned with a word. There's going to be times where God's going to ask you to do things that will require you to believe without reason. So we need to know, did God say it? Did God speak it? And here we find, he asked them, why do you reason? There's several questions. Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? Now, one of the things that I want, I want you to grasp this, when they were feeding the 5,000, 
one of the most important things, and what I, what I said before, it's sad that when God begins to do a miracle and we fail to see what the purpose of that miracle was for in our life. And what the disciples did not see was that, this. Remember when in the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, blessed it, and gave it to them. Here's the point. The multiplication of the bread and the fish did not take place in Jesus' hands. It took place when it was in their hands. When they begin to break the loaves is when the bread begin to multiply. But here's what, what I'm saying. They didn't know and they didn't perceive that Jesus was trying to empower them to work miracles. They thought it was just only come from Jesus himself. When Jesus gave the bread and the fish to them and they begin to give it away, the bread and the loaves were multiplied. And here's the point. They didn't understand or believe that God could actually use them. That's why their hearts were hardened. That's why Jesus said that their hearts were hardened when they were in the, in the sea. What, God, what was God trying to say? God was trying to say this. Guys, when I give you a commission, it is because of your submission to the word that brings breakthrough. It is when I am commissioned. Everyone say commission. When he commissions me, and I come into submission to the word, that's when the revelation, and that's when breakthrough comes. But here's the thing. They didn't recognize that God was actually using them as they were given the bread and dispersing the bread and the fish to the crowds. Here's the point. Jesus does miracles in our lives and for us so that we will in turn begin to see his world come into our world and where he is multiplied and increasing through us. Amen? Can you say amen? amen? You see, God is wanting to touch your hands. God is wanting to bring revelation and breakthrough through, through your hands. Not just from his hands. Now, it started with Jesus. It started with his words. But the disciples, as they were giving the bread, they completely missed it. They didn't know that as they were giving and dispersing the bread that the miracle of multiplication was working through them. But they failed to see it because of a weak-minded, low self-esteem, very narrow understanding of who they were and what they possessed when they were with Jesus. And when Jesus sent them in the boat, he wanted them to know that they had the same power to command the winds even though you don't know that I'm with you in the boat, I am still with you because my word has never left you. Can you say amen? amen. I want to tell you something. Carol and I, <clears throat> you know, we've, we've had a series in our life. We've been married for 37 years, amazing years with a, just a wonderful wife. I love my wife, Carol. She's been an amazing woman of faith. But I remember there's been times where Carol and I, many times, when we would speak faith, it actually seemed like certain problems got worse. How many of you have ever done that? You've been in a situation, you speak faith, and the problem gets worse. I remember I used to do this. I'd say, you know, God, I'm almost feeling like I don't want to speak faith because every time I speak faith, believe you, it seems like problems get worse. And so the temptation was to pull back. I didn't realize that I was falling right into a trap that Satan was setting because the devil wants me to think that trusting God will only get you into a bigger mess. It was a lie from the enemy. God was saying setbacks are setups for greater miracles. What is a miracle? What is a miracle? A miracle is something that happens in your life that gives no reason or logical reason or meaning or something that is beyond a, a physical or human ability. So God has to allow us to confront things that are beyond our own ability 
And then he wants us to stand on the word and he wants us to begin to draw from him. I want you to jump with me to 2 Corinthians. Last scripture, we're going to close in prayer. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians 4. Listen to what Peter says here. Or Paul, I'm sorry. Paul. Verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not know... Actually, let's go back to verse 13. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith according to what is written, I believed and therefore I speak. We also believe and therefore we speak. Everyone say speak. It is important that the word comes out of your mouth. I've got to speak the word. Amen? Amen. I've got to speak it. I've got to speak healing over my body. I'm going to speak victory. I'm going to speak into existence that miracle. We speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. Everyone say knowing. It's not enough to speak, but we often have to. Faith is knowing. Everyone say expect. I'm expecting. Faith speaks. Faith knows. I know. I know this is going to happen. Remember when I was looking for a job years ago, my wife said, Ray, I know it's coming. And I said, you do? Yes. yes, it's coming. Are you sure? Yes, it's coming. I have to walk by faith. Now, by the way, when you begin to live by faith, there's going to be some people around you. They're going to shake their head and say, you know, you're kind of crazy. <laughs> by the way, that's a good sign. When people start saying you're crazy, then you know you're right on the verge of supernatural things. Because that's what makes things supernatural things so powerful. Because it shouldn't happen. But notice what he goes on here to say. For all things are for what? He didn't say some things. It says everything is for your sake. That grace having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing. Yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction. What he's telling us here is that there might be some affliction. There might even actually be times where you're believing God. Listen to me. There might even be seasons where you might even sustain some short, some losses. There are some things that you might even lose. Paul says, I have suffered the loss of certain things that I might gain Christ. How many of you know you never lose anything that God doesn't want you to lose, but won't, he won't return with it much greater things? There's sometimes that we walk through things and we might lose certain things, but because we're going to gain something much more glorious. And so he says, for the afflictions, which is but for a moment, is working for us. Everyone say, working for me. This, this is what Jesus is saying. I'm bringing my world into your world because I'm working a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are seen are eternal. Can you say amen? You should bow your heads. Because I believe right now God wants to give us eternal eyes. I believe God wants to open our eyes to things that are glorious. God wants us to stop looking at things that seem to be slipping out of our hands. God wants us to stop looking at things through our natural lens. He's actually transforming your lens into a supernatural lens. You are becoming a problem solver. God spoke to me years ago. He said, Ray, there's not a problem that you're walking through that I didn't allow you to walk through because I trust you. I didn't know that. I didn't know that a problem 
was a sign from God that he could entrust me with that kind of a problem. God was saying, I trust you. I trust that you're going to make it through this because you're going to grow from this and you're going to become a solution. I'm going to bring solutions through this problem to you and it's going to be to the testimony of God's glory. Sometimes we look at a problem and we say, well, I've done something wrong. I've missed God or I don't have faith. Stop allowing the devil to tear you down like that. Problems sometimes are a sign that God can trust you. Sometimes things you're walking through are a sign that God can entrust you with something. I love what Paul, Ananias said over Paul in Acts 9. He says, Saul, God has chose you, chosen you to suffer many things. He's chosen you to suffer many things for his glory. Because, and th this is amazing, here's a terrorist, here's a guy who is terrorizing Christians, and yet the Lord through this, this Christian, Ananias says that you're a chosen vessel, and God's going to entrust you to suffer many things, because he knows you're going to respond, and you're going to come through this, and your life, and your testimony is going to bring glory and solutions to so many. I believe God is changing the way we think. I believe he's trying to let us know that we're no longer are we going to look at problems as setbacks, but setups. He's bringing his world into our world this morning. And maybe this morning you may say, you know, Pastor Ray, I want an anointing. I, I am praying right now that my mind will be anointed afresh for great faith. I have allowed the enemy, maybe even through just, maybe you've been speaking some negative things. Maybe you've been speaking fear. God wants you to begin to do what Paul says here, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. And we begin to give thanks. God wants you to begin to realize you're a problem solver. You're going to be a miracle worker. You're going you're to see breakthrough because God's trusting you with a problem to bring a solving to that problem. Maybe this morning you say, Pastor, will you just pray for me? I need my faith to be quickened this morning, my vision to be enlarged. That's me this morning. Raise your hand. Anybody this morning? Okay, I see that hand. My faith to be enlarged. Praise God. Father, we thank you for their honesty. We thank you, Lord. There's a dozen hands. Lord, you're doing great things. Awesome people. Awesome people. Amazing people. Lord, you're doing amazing things. Father, all these hands, I pray, Lord, right now for an anointing to rest upon them. Let them see, Lord, that he which hath begun a good work will be able to bring it to completion, to finish it. God is doing a great thing. Great rewards. Great rewards. Amen. Look, look at me right here. Donna, the Lord just gave me a word. You have a gift of faith. And there are some rewards that are in heaven that have packages on it with your name on it. I just, I, I'm not kidding. As I was praying, the Lord, I, I saw a Christmas tree. I don't know why Christmas, maybe it's around, but I saw a bunch of packages that says, Donna. And these are things you are believing God for. And these packages are coming to your house. You have been praying. There's a gift of faith on you. And the Lord's seen your heart. There's a purity. There's a, a consecration from the Lord. And you're precious in his sight. And not one prayer, not one tear has fallen to the ground. There's packages. I saw packages, presents, big presents coming to you. Can you receive that? Praise God. It's coming. It's coming. Praise God. Also, Randy, Randy, amen, Carissa, you are a delight to the Lord. I, I just saw the Lord just say, I'm coming to your house. I'm going to open the heavens on you, and there are going to be people coming to your house, and you're going to share them, share with them God's great love. Because God has done such a transformation in your life. 
Amen. He wants you to do one thing, though. He wants you to forget those things which are behind. He wants you to never bring up things in the past. You are new people. You are a new couple. People are going to be coming to you. I just see people flooding into your house, your apartment. In fact, you're not going to have a house big enough. To get, you're going to be having parties and people are, people are going to come over there because there is a charisma upon you. There, there is a, Randy, God's going to use you to bring hope to hopelessness and hopeless people. Both of you understand what it is to be at the bottom. But now God's going to bring you to the top. He's going to show you his great love. And there's going to be such a joy. People are going to be attracted to your testimony, but also the joy. And it's a new day. Both of you need to continue to say, this is a new day. It's a new day. It's going to come on your house, your blessing, your children. Amen. And you know what? Here's another word. The Lord spoke to me. Just said, it. tell them, I'm so proud of you. So proud of you. Isn't it great to have your father tell you I'm proud of you? Randy, he's proud of you. He's proud of you. Amen? Amen. How, how many of you know that it's God's goodness and his faithfulness? So many of you need to know, Randy, Randall, he's proud of you. You're an awesome father. You're an awesome yeah. mother. Praise God, Orphan Randall, amazing people. Amen. You guys carry with you an amazing anointing. And you know what? We're not going to look at our circumstances. We're not going to look at what we've gone through. We're going to look to him. Because he is faithful who began a good work. Amen. Awesome. Awesome things ahead. Amen. Tanner, praise God. Take my hand. Praise God. Amen. You can't even imagine. It hasn't even entered in your heart. Your eyes haven't seen, hasn't even entered into your heart the things that God has prepared for you that love him. And you know what? You're a gift. You are a gift. Your life, and you're not just a gifted young man, you're not just intelligent, but you are a gift. And the Lord wants you to know you are so special. You're not just an accident. You're not just your putting time in on earth. God has a real, uh, there's some real leadership on you. you. You're a magnet with some gifts. God wants to use you to draw people to know the Lord. He wants you to start, when you open your mouth, people are going to listen. Because he's given you a gift that way. Amen. Awesome. I see God just drawing, using you to draw young people that would never darken the door of the church. But they'll hear the message. Let me tell you, your generation does not want religion. They don't want, they don't even want association. They're not into labels. What they are into is experiences. Your generation is into experience. They want to know a reality, what's real. And through the Holy Spirit, as you begin to look to God, God's going to use you to draw people into an experience, into the reality of who Jesus is to us. Amen. But, but, but he wants you to believe in yourself. He wants you to believe in yourself because God believes in you. It's not you in yourself, but it's what Christ is doing in you. Awesome. Praise God. Fantastic. How many of you believe God wants to do awesome things in our lives? Yeah. Great things. Amazing things. I love it when the Bible says when they were all fed, the 5,000, it says that the people marveled and were moved and were amazed. You know, our services should be like that. There should be some amazing things where you leave here and say, well, wasn't it amazing at new life today? That's the kind of services we should have. Nothing short of that. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to close in prayer. I know my time is gone. Amen. His world into my world. Amen. Let's lift our hands. Father, we thank you today. We thank you, Father, that you come to give us good gifts. You come, Lord, to enlarge our world. Lord, you come to bless us exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. Father, we just repent of narrow-minded, small-minded thinking and believing. 
We embrace our identity. It's faith, covenant, believing, giant, killer, mountain-moving people that are possessing promises, standing on the promises of God, pulling down strongholds. Father, we thank you that your word and your promises are yea and amen. Lord, give us a vision to see our world through your eyes. We give you praise. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a hand, shall we?